On February 9, 1921, Carol Dale Briscoe was born. He was my grandfather, the father of my mother. He was also a hero to us all, and the person I think about on Memorial Day. This is Betty Dunn Bretherton, the love of his life and my grandmother. They said if Betty Dunn wanted to do it, Betty Dunn did it, and she graduated high school at 15. They met at the University of Oklahoma. This is the Sooner Drug Store where my grandfather worked as a soda jerk, and this was my grandmother at 18 years old. During their courtship, the Nazis rolled through Europe. By 1941, my grandfather had completed two years of college, and the Nazis seemed bent on world domination. Though the United States had yet to enter the war in Europe, my grandfather knew it was coming, and he didn't want to wait to get ready. He volunteered for the Army Air Cadet Program. By March of 1942, with the U.S. now in a world war, my grandfather was attached to a pursuit squadron. But before he could be shipped off to war, he was recruited to fly the B-17, the Flying Fortress. He and my grandmother got married on his way to the B-17 pilot training program. And by the time he was done his training, she was pregnant. On December 6, 1942, my grandfather was sent to join the 306th Bombardment Group known as the Reich Wreckers. His squadron was the Fight and Bighton 369th. He's indicated in this group photo by the pointer. It took five weeks to fly his B-17 from Salinas, Kansas to Thurlai, England, the home of the 306th. As soon as he arrived, they took his brand new B-17F and gave it to another crew. They also sent him to the brand new high altitude bombing school for two weeks. While he was at that school, the 306 flew the first daylight bombing mission over Germany. He named his first B-17 the Betty Blitz after my grandmother, but his crew became known for this plane, the Joan of Arc. The name came from the tail gunner's French origins, and the Joan of Arc safely carried them through 10 of their 25 combat missions. Though he always flew with a crew of 10 men, these nine made up the main crew of the Joan of Arc. You can actually make out my grandfather's face looking out the window at the camera. On February 14, 1943, my grandfather flew his first B-17 combat mission as co-pilot with another crew to gain some experience. It was only the fourth daylight bombing mission over Germany. The footage you're seeing comes from an Army Air Corps documentary on the Memphis Bell. This mission to Wilhelmshaven, Germany is just one of 10 separate missions that my grandfather flew along with the Memphis Bell. He always felt that this was an accurate depiction of what most of his combat missions were like, although some were much easier and some were much harder. On his first mission as pilot, his second combat mission, the bombs hung up in the bomb rack over the target area. It took three men 20 minutes to get the bombs to release. Each of them suffered frostbite from hanging their bodies over the open bomb bay door, literally jumping, prying, pounding on the bombs to get them to release. On his fourth mission, the Betty Blitz was the only plane to get severely damaged from the 306. He crossed the channel using only two engines, and when he landed, the plane was turned over for a complete overhaul due to the extensive damage. On April 17, 1943, he was flying the Skywolf, number 218, on a mission over Bremen, Germany. It was the worst mission for the 306. They lost 10 of their 24 aircraft. In one mission, my grandfather lost 100 friends. They didn't fly another mission for almost two weeks but it was only going to get worse. On May 1st, 1943, my grandfather flew his 10th and worst mission of the war. It was to bomb the subpens at Saint-Nazaire, France. This is actual government footage from that mission. 
With the Joan of Arc in for repairs, the crew flew on number 404, the Giesel. The mission was a pretty typical mission, until they arrived at Saint Nazir. Cloud cover obscured the target, making it impossible to bomb accurately. It was a very bad run. And just after the bomb run, the number three prop on my grandfather's plane ran away, so we had to shut that engine down. At this point, though a number of the planes were damaged by flak and enemy fire, they all were able to regroup and head back to England. This is where it stopped being a typical mission. The command aircraft, the aircraft leading the entire group, got lost. And their command radio was out, so they couldn't tell the rest of the group and rely upon them for guidance. At 1313 mission time, they made a 90 degree turn to the east-northeast. At that point, the navigator saw land and thought it was the coast of England. It was not. It was Brest, France. Brest was not only well protected by anti-aircraft guns, but it also had a number of fighter squadrons. My grandfather's formation was only at 800 feet when the fighters began their attack. At some point during the half hour long attack, my grandfather noticed a flak barge was in his line of flight. A fighter pilot at heart, my grandfather took the B-17 down to 300 feet for a strafing run at the barge. They were so close to the firing guns that the concussion rocked the plane. Staff Sergeant Rose, the ball turret gunner, got multiple passes on the deck of the flak barge, taking out guns as well as crew on the deck. At some point, a shell exploded off of the glass of the ball turret, sandpapering Rose's face with shards of glass. This disabled the ball turret. As Rose is climbing out of the ball turret, an FW-190 came in at 6 o'clock high, straight at the tail of the aircraft. Staff Sergeant Roller, the tail gunner, exchanged fire directly with the FW-190. They each were getting hits on each other. An incendiary round broke the oxygen line to the tail and set the tail on fire. Just as Roller sent a burst of rounds directly into the nose of the FW-190, a shell blasted off the right grip of the tail gun, severing nerves in Roller's right arm. The F-190 rolled over hard and crashed right into the water. During this exchange, Staff Sergeant Newport, the radio operator, was also severely injured and incapacitated. Still under attack and down three guns, Rose and Roller both set to putting the fire out in the tail. It took 10 minutes and four fire extinguishers to put it out. In between fire extinguishers, Rose was beating the fire out with his hands. Roller used his one good hand to bend the metal oxygen line closed, allowing them to extinguish the fire. Roller then took position in the radio gun, firing the gun with his left hand until he passed out. Having finally escaped the enemy attack, my grandfather took inventory of the plane. Number three prop ran away, feathered. Gas leak from number three engine. Number two supercharger shot out. Radio shot out. Aileron controls shot out. Elevator controls shot up. Radio compass shot out. Hydraulic system shot out. Intercom to tail shot out. Oxygen shot out. Tail gunner, radio operator, and ball turret gunner wounded. With only two engines, the Giesel fell behind the rest of the bombing group. They were on their own. Very quickly, the gas leak for number three got bad enough that my grandfather shut off the number four engine to prevent another fire. On only one engine for power, their altitude dropped down to 60 feet where the ground effect helped them to stay aloft. They were headed straight for the southernmost airstrip in England at Predanac. The problem was, the coast of England was a 300 foot high cliff. My grandfather struggled to keep the plane in the air for 1 hour and 17 minutes until they reached the coastal cliffs of England. As they got closer to land, a thermal lifted the B-17, giving them the altitude that they needed to clear the cliffs. Upon landing, the plane broke in two through the radio room. The Giesel flew its last mission. Three out of the 12 aircraft in my grandfather's formation were shot down. Seven B-17s went down in all. 73 men were lost. 18 were wounded. And two on returning planes were killed. One of the other planes in my grandfather's formation that returned had Sergeant Maynard Smith aboard. He was the only man from the 306 to receive the Medal of Honor. He earned it on this mission by doing practically the exact same job that Rose and Roller did on his ship, except single-handedly, putting out an intense fire 
while continuing a battle when he could with the machine guns. What my grandfather didn't know until two days later is that my grandmother made him a father 45 minutes into this mission. She named their daughter Carol June in honor of my grandfather with two R's and two L's. My grandfather flew another seven missions on the Joan of Arc before it just was worn out. It had too many combat hours. And so he was given the 993, which he named the Carol June after his newborn daughter that he had yet to meet. For his last mission, he was assigned to the 423rd, the Grim Reapers. He flew the mission as a tail gunner in honor of Roller, who was still recuperating in a hospital in England. He returned a decorated war hero and he finally got to meet my mother when she was four months old. The Mustang, the P-51, longest range fighter in the world. Speed, fast climb, quick dive, tight turn. A fighter pilot's dream. The long range P-51 fighter capable of escorting the striking force to and from its objective put in an appearance toward the end of 1943. In mid-1944, Colonel Bud Peasley developed the idea of the Weather Scout, flying P-51D Mustangs to get actual eyes on the targets and report back to the bombers which was the most bombable. This top secret group consisted of an equal mix of experienced bomber pilots and experienced fighter pilots. The bomber pilots led the scouting part of the mission with the fighter pilots taking the lead if there were ever any enemy contact. After serving as flight instructor stateside for nearly a year and a half, my grandfather was selected to be operations officer and squad leader of the first fighting scouts of the 8th Air Force. He couldn't tell his family what he was doing other than he was going back to Europe and he was going back to combat. Fighters sought targets of opportunity. Anything and everything that moved on the German earth was either bombed or strafed. It was only a matter of time. With much of the Luftwaffe destroyed by this part in the war, the fighting scouts spent the combat portions of their mission strafing targets of opportunity on the ground. When flying these missions, my grandfather really had only two fears, getting lost and losing an engine. In fact, the first fighting scouts did not lose a single man to enemy action, but they did lose several to mechanical failures. My grandfather flew 14 combat missions as a fighting scout before the war in Europe was over. Coincidentally, my grandfather was quite the cartoon artist, and since air transport had become safer by 1945, he was allowed to send actual letters home instead of V-mail. So not only did he write a lengthy letter to my grandmother almost every day, he also drew her a cartoon, and some of them were quite risque. He definitely missed my grandmother a lot, and he showed it both with word and illustration. After the war in Europe was over, he got tapped to fly the head general of the Air Force Bomb Damage Assessment Group around on missions showing him how they would have been flown in an effort to learn lessons to apply to Japan should a conventional bombing campaign begin. He and his friends were just biding their time until the inevitable transfer to the Pacific came along. But by August, the war with Japan was over as well, and on September 1st, 1945, they sent my grandfather home once and for all. After the war was over, my grandfather decided to stay in the military, helping to transform the U.S. Army Air Corps into the Air Force we know it today. He retired a colonel in 1970, 29 years after he joined the Air Cadet Program. During World War II, he was awarded the Air Medal five times and the Distinguished Flying Cross twice. And at the end of his career, 
they honored him with the Legion of Merit. Though he retired from the Air Force, he didn't leave the culture far behind. He went to work for USAA, a company founded to meet the insurance needs of military members. He also kept in close contact with his crew, the crew of the Joan of Arc. He stayed with USAA until he retired as Executive Vice President and COO of their life insurance company. All the while, the love that he and Betty shared never wavered. They were always wonderful grandparents to me, and they were also wonderful great-grandparents to my daughter who got to know them when they moved to North Carolina to be closer to family. They were married for 66 wonderful years. Then, in November of 2008, my grandmother had an unexpected stroke and passed away. My grandfather was distraught, and his health rapidly failed him. Just days after I took this photo of my daughter with my grandfather, he celebrated his 88th birthday with a bite of birthday cake. That was the last bite of solid food that he ate. He decided he was done fighting, that it was time to be with Betty. Six days later, he passed away peacefully in his sleep with my aunt lovingly at his side. He was buried next to Betty in Arlington National Cemetery overlooking the Air Force Memorial. This was his burial ceremony. Memorial Day is a time for us to remember those who sacrificed so much so that we could enjoy the freedoms that we have today. This Memorial Day, as with every Memorial Day, I remember my grandfather. Thank you, Grandel, for all you've done. I love you.